This is going to be a study on the subject of the real visitors from outer space. In the not-so-distant future, people on Earth are going to see some strange-looking clouds and a shadow going over the land. It will not be a spaceship from another planet. It will be the Lord Jesus Christ and all his saints. And I'm going to show you the premillennial view, which is... You're going to believe Jesus Christ has to come back before his kingdom is set up. People on earth are going to see some UFOs. They're going to see something like what took up Elijah back there in the Old Testament. Those horses of fire and a whirlwind. First, look, let's look at the occupants of the UFOs. UFOs just unidentified flying objects people aren't going to know what these things are that's coming down they're not going to be able to identify them but who is it it's the lord jesus christ revelation 19 11 says and i saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war at the first coming he came as a lamb this time he comes as a lion. Revelation 5.5 5 calls him the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's not going to be holding a sign that says, I come in peace. At the first coming, he rode a donkey. This time, he's going to be riding a white horse. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. So at this coming, every eye shall see him. But at the rapture, it seems only we, born-again Christians, will see him. And at this second coming, when every eye shall see him, I don't think there will be time to post it on YouTube or any conspiracy theory site. When the Lord comes back. And Hollywood isn't going to get a chance to make a movie about it. They're going to be too scared of the UFO occupant. Revelation 19.12 says his eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. The first time he had a crown of thorns. But this time he has many crowns. Because they're not going to crucify him again. They're not going to be able to take some of these UFO occupants alive and put them on some military base somewhere. But his eyes of a flame that's as a flame of fire will stare sinners in the eye as he goes across the land in fiery indignation. They will look into the eyes of their maker and they weren't prepared to meet their God. Revelation 19.13 says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So his vesture is bloody from the horses trampling the enemies. Remember, at the first coming, it was his blood being shed for sinners. Now, when he comes the second time, it's sinners' blood being shed. The Christ rejectors on earth, and he will not be speaking in some weird type of alien language. He will speak sharp two edged sword. That's what's going to be coming out of his mouth, the words of God. But what other occupants will be riding on these supernatural white horses? The saints. Revelation nineteen fourteen says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen white and clean so we're all going to look similar all going to be wearing the same clothes just like they portray aliens in the movies they all got the same stuff on but these are the real invaders from outer space that the men in black or the spiritual wickedness want to com combat but we're going to be in glorified bodies we can't be hurt we'll have supernatural strength 
We will be without fear. We'll be able to fall upon a sword and not be wounded. Uh, we won't be trying to phone home because we already went home and we're already back already. We already went to the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now we're back on earth to take over. Jude one fourteen and 15 says, And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So at the rapture, he comes back to get me. At the second coming, he's coming back with me. These are two different events. At the rapture, he abducts me and beams me up. At the second coming, we travel from heaven through the sea of glass at the speed of light and come down to the bloodbath that's going to be a bloodbath called Armageddon. And there's going to be some survivors on the winning side. That's on the winning side with these visitors from outer space. They are Jews, the believing Jews. Romans eleven twenty five and 26 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, and to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Remember, at his first coming, the Jews rejected him. At the second coming, the Jews receive him and get saved. There's differences of things in the Bible. The first coming isn't the second coming. The rapture isn't when he comes back in vengeance. You know, there's you got to learn to study, compare things. Things are different. But now let's look at these earthlings that are going to be roaming around when... The visitors from outer space come back to take over. What will these earthlings see? In Revelation 1-7 it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, imagine if there was a UFO invasion right now, and everybody could look up and see this UFO in the sky, how scared and terrified people would be. Matthew twenty four twenty seven says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So there's going to be clouds, there's going to be lightning, there's going to be supernatural horses coming back with a man on it, with eyes as a flame of fire. Matthew twenty four twenty nine through 30 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great, great glory. So it's dark. The dark sky is lightened up by the light from his coming. Stars are falling from heaven. And you also have an earthquake. Pretty much every disaster movie rolled into one. And men today have luxurious underground bunkers that they're building for some big disaster. Maybe some type of invasion or something. But this won't survive the earthquake. You can't make a secret hideout to hide from the one who sits on the throne. The Ancient of Days... Who knows all the deep and secret things? But who will witness this? Who will witness the takeover of the planet? The takeover of the planet. The nations will witness this. Revelation 19.15 says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The Bible says in Psalms, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. You know, they're always talking about that some other alien from outer space has created earth and created the beings on earth, and they've planted us here, and they're watching us from a distance. That's because they don't want to admit that there's an almighty God. 
But if you can admit that there's some aliens that's created us from some distant planet, why can't you admit that there's a God that created us that's up in heaven? As Daniel said, there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven that created us that's watching, watching us. And all the nations have forgotten God. Isaiah 40, 15 says, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. And the nations are going to gather together. How, the, how do the nations gather together? In Revelation 16, 12, it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared so the waters are dried up so the armies can gather together faster. This way they can be killed quicker. The ecumenical movement and the one world government will bring everyone together against God. But this is actually God's plan so that he can just destroy them quicker. As he says in Zephaniah 3.8, it says, Determination to gather the nations. And he says, the earth shall be devour, devoured with the fire of his jealousy. But people have the wrong idea of God. The Bible talks about a God of wrath. He's a God of love, but he's a God of wrath. But people have another Jesus. Uh, notice the descriptions of Jesus Christ when he comes back. He's full of wrath, fire, fierce anger, indignation. The Hollywood Jesus is not full of these things. Uh, the Hollywood Jesus is... Preachers don't teach these things. Joel Osteen would never preach the wrath of God. He's too busy at Lady Gaga concerts in support of the LGBT community. But if you try to hide, the eyes as a flame of fire will burn right through your house or bunker or ship, and all faces shall gather blackness. The people are going to be much pained. And the same eagles that they care about saving so much from extinction is the same eagles that are going to eat their carcasses. They're going to be bird food. Revelation nineteen sixteen and 17 says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw another, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Matthew twenty four twenty eight. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So, at the rapture, when we leave out of here, we're going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But at the second coming, the birds will have supper. And that's where you get the saying, this is for the birds. Revelation 19.18 says that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and, the, and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Notice that God is no respecter of persons. The rich can't buy their way into his favor. If they reject Jesus Christ, they're going to be killed and become bird food. Revelation 19.19 19 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sit on the horse and against his army. Uh, men always gather together against Jesus Christ. Men who hate each other will join forces because of their mutual hatred for Jesus. Uh, Bill Clinton said once that the only thing that will get the nations together is an alien invasion. And he's right. They'll all try to gang up on the Son of God. But who else is going to be destroyed at this time when the visitors from outer space come in the clouds? The beast and the false prophet. Revelation 19.20 says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with a brimstone. The Jesus that many preachers tell us about today is another Jesus. A Jesus that wouldn't put men in the lake of fire. The Hollywood Jesus doesn't mention hell. Joel Osteen's Jesus would throw you into the lake of puppies and pancakes. 
But Jesus puts these men in a lake of fire and brimstone, not separation from God, but fire and torment. After the rapture, God sends a strong delusion, but here, as you just read at the second coming, the one God used to deceive during that strong delusion is cast into the lake of fire. There's a difference between the rapture and the second coming when the Lord comes back in vengeance. And you know, you can say the rapture is the first half of the second coming, but there's still a difference in the events. There's an event where the Lord comes back to get me, and then there's an event where the Lord comes back with me. There's a difference between the Lord's first coming when he died on the cross and his second coming when he comes in to kill the God-haters. And those who took the mark of the beast will be destroyed. Revelation 14, 9 and 10 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Men love to get drunk, so the Lord gets them drunk on his wrath. He says in Isaiah 63, 6, And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. At his first coming, Jesus Christ took the cup of wrath on himself. That's why he said, let this cup pass from me. But at the second coming, he pours out his wrath on man. Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So knowing that these men are going to have to face a wrathful Jesus Christ should give us more of a burden to win lost souls. But let's talk more about the weapon of these visitors from outer space. And we mentioned it before, how it's a sword. Revelation 19.21 says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. You see all these people trying to put swords in their mouth and stuff, and they call that a talon or something. Th this is nothing to the Lord. He just He's going to have a sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. Uh, at his first coming, he wasn't trying to set up his kingdom by force, but at the second coming, he is. Because at his first coming, he said in John eighteen thirty six, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. And his sword that he's going to take the kingdom by force with is the word of God. Hebrews 4, 12 tells us, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we possess this same sword and hold it in our hand. Right now, you can pick up the sword that the visitors from outer space are going to possess. Psalms 149.6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Ephesians 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Some men hold the sword in unrighteousness. Romans 1, 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You hold the truth in unrighteousness when you take this book and you correct it and say, well, this word really should have been this or a better translation would have been this and you go to your Greek and your Hebrew to correct it or whatever you're doing. Uh, but who wants pieces of their weapon missing before they go to war? Why would you take out parts of your Bible? So we hold in our hands a weapon that will be used to bring in the kingdom. But we've seen the winners at the second coming, which is those occupants of those unidentified flying objects, those supernatural horses. We've seen 
the witnesses at the second coming. That's the God-haters, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the people who took the mark of the beast, all the wicked nations. We've seen the weapon at the second coming. But now let's see the wounds at the second coming. One of the UFO occupants is going to have wounds in his hands and his feet. In Zechariah 12.10 it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So at the second coming Jesus still has the wounds in his hands, in his feet, in the pierced side, in his glorified body. Because remember, Thomas said, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. He still got the wounds. Zechariah thirteen six says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The Jews rejected him. They had him crucified. They said, His blood be on us and on our children. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But he's coming back again. And the Jews are going to be saved. But not only is there going to be wounds on the Savior, there's going to be wounds on the enemies, the earthlings on earth, that are scared stiff of the visitors from outer space. Joel 2, 6 says, Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. It's going to be like a nuclear blast going off in their face. Imagine those movies where you see a big bomb or a big spaceship dropping something out of it and it just leveling a whole city or something. It's going to be something like that. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the problem. They don't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm seventy-eight sixty-five says, Then the Lord awaked as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. That's describing the Lord at the second coming. And many people try to make the Lord a drunk, so he mocks them by coming back as a man that shouteth by reason of wine. And Psalm seventy-eight sixty-six says, And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts and put them to a perpetual reproach. This is where you get the saying he's going to kick their hind in because he's going to smite them in their hinder parts. Habakkuk 3, 12 and 13 says, Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people even for salvation with thine anointed. And thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Selah. So when you're mowing your yard, this is a good picture of Jesus Christ coming back on his white horse because it will be like he is on a threshing machine mowing through the enemies of God. But the real visitors from outer space are the good guys here. I mean, there's going to be some visitors from outer space that are bad guys in the tribulation, and there's visitors from outer space now that are bad guys, but the real visitors from outer space, the ones that you're going to be really scared of if you're not saved, is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back with all his saints at the second coming. So the best thing you can do right now is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And if you want to be saved, all you have to do is come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner you are and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross to be payment for your sins. You can't earn your salvation. Your salvation only comes 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he paid all he paid for all your sins on the cross. You just have to accept the payment. So come to him the best way you know how and let him know you're going to believe on him today. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. <laughs>